for finding the the percentage of changing of percentage of changes in both displacement and also time. And differential equations, on the other hand, are simply equations that evolve derivatives of one or more functions. And in the course of our presentation, we'll be using several notations of differential equations. And the most common is uh, Leibniz notation, which takes the dy dx uh, structure or format. And we're also going to see, we are also going to see uh, the Lagrange um, format also. And of course, there are others like partial notation and Newton's um, dot format. We, I don't expect for us to uh, encounter that in the course of this presentation, but it's just good to know that. And the, the, of course, there are different types of differential equations, and the two most important ones are ordinary differential equations and also partial differential equations. In simple terms, ordinary differential equations are differential equations that is a function of itself. And in most simpler term, it's just an equation that solves just only one independent variable, while partial differential equations involve solving multiple variables. Uh, for the course of this uh, presentation, we'll be focusing on ordinary differential equations. And in, when I dive into the core of the presentation, I'll, well, I'm going to show uh, methods used to solve uh, simple ordinary differential equations. And in the course of this uh, presentation also, I'll be making mention of the orders of which uh, differential equations can occur in. And this particular um, version, sorry, this particular version you see uh, the y dx using the Leibniz notation uh, is a first order derivative. Just basically look out for the largest, uh, the largest uh, part of the function or the or the equation, and check the power that it wish it is the power that it wish it is raised to. And the first one you see the largest is two y, and it is raised to the power of one, so it is a first order derivative. Basically, what it means is that this is the simplest form in which this equation can this equation can exist. So you cannot uh, differentiate this particular uh, equation further. Uh, in, in in simple calculus uh, manipulation and calculation, if you, for instance, if you have an equation which is like, for instance, y is equals to two x squared plus four x. If you if you differentiate that, you expect that to be equal to five four uh, x plus four, because you basically take the power and then multiply the the uh, integer with the power of the function. And the other example is a second order derivative uh, because y has a power of square. So this second order derivative can be simplified further. And in this instance, the simplified, the simplified version is going to be 2y plus 4 plus 4, or plus 4y instead, because x is going to be, s is the, uh, is the dependent variable. That's why it's called dy dx, the function of change of dy in respect to x. So the simplified version is going to be 2y plus 4. X. We don't need to know all of this for, but it's just like good to, uh, it's good residual knowledge to know as I, so because I don't have time to like be diving into some of the specifics when we start the core of the presentation. And why, why, what is the possible purpose of studying differential equations in the first place? Not just really differential equations in the first place. What is the purpose of doing all of this and also calculus? Uh, a good example that I like to use is if you're driving from the whole stretch of Lagos to Ibadan, uh, I think it's around 130 kilometers. It's impossible to measure the exact speed at every point or at any point within that journey. What I mean is that in regular arithmetics, if to find the, the value of speed, right? You need the distance and time. So what it means is that you have to travel the whole distance before you can now uh, calculate it with the time you spent traveling before you can find the speed. And imagine if you had to like, that's what you use to measure the speed at which uh, cars move. It's going to be possible to measure the speed, the instantaneous speed of cars. So what is used is um, calculus. Calculus is used to solve those kind of problems, to find the instantaneous speed at any point within that journey. So for instance, if you are traveling and you get to the uh, Shagamu or something somewhere along that road, you can your speedometer 
on your dashboard is going to tell you the exact speed that you're moving at at that particular point. And this this kind of problems that cannot be modeled with regular arithmetics is what um, calculus helps to solve. And it's used in modeling natural phenomena, um, engineering applications, physical sciences, and of course, economics and finance. And also biological sciences, um, optimization problems, and also scientific research. So yeah, um, diving into the core of what I have to present today, uh, the first method is called uh, Euler's method. Euler's method is a basic numerical method or technique that is used to estimate the solution of um, ordinary differential equations. is a step-by-step -step approach to approximating the behavior of a function. Uh, is basically, if you remember from the introduction, I, I said there are two types of differential equations. We have uh, ordinary and also partial. So um, Euler is very, is very good for solving um, ordinary differential equations. And basically it takes step-by-step -step approach uh, to solve or to like get the closest estimates to what the function of an equation is. Uh, what that means is that if you draw the graph of an equation, not a straight line uh, graph like where you have quadratic equations, like a proper calculus uh, function or equation. If you draw the graph, the graph is usually parabolic. So if you want to find the the uh, volume of a container, for instance, is the with calculus of an un unknown sized uh, container, the the graph is going to be parabolic and to find the volume with it, what um, Euler's method does is it has multiple slopes at different points. So it basically course correct on like where you have like with a straight line graph where it just basically just draw a straight line and you calculate the graph of that. But with Euler's method, you have multiple instances. When I dive into an example, you see what I mean by using multiple, um, multiple values of slopes to get the closest estimate to it. But something to know with Euler's method is that it has the downside of at any just a predictive status, the higher the number of time functions. Uh, time functions is basically the amount of time you want to move the value of X in respect to Y. That's like the slope. But regardless, it is quite adequate for most uh, first order equations. You just have to just know that the more, uh, the higher the number of time functions you use, the less accurate it becomes. And if you know how, if you know that you can like uh, plan your solutions and to to prepare for that uh, abnormality, and Euler's formula is given as basically this: y n plus one is equal to y n plus h, and the function of the derivative of y n in respect to x n, and y n plus one is basically a good way to just know this is to to find the value of y at a certain point. You use the value of y. In the preceding, in the preceding time point, and this gives the breakdown of what all of these symbols mean. Y here represents the numerical approximation of y at the end step. That's the current step you want to solve for, and y a plus one represents the numerical. Okay, y a plus one represents the numerical approximation of the current step you want to solve for. One y and y here is the end step. That's the preceding step, and x here represents the value of x at also that preceding step. And H is the step that's a constant. That's what you use to navigate between one slope to the next slope. When I dive into an example, you're gonna understand what I mean by moving from one step to the another. Um, so given, given uh, consider an equation where you have Y is equal to X square, and also given is a function of Y that is 1.5. Basically what this means is at Y in the value of uh, x and at that point is 1.5. So the function of this is equals to 2x. If you should, if you should um, differentiate this, this function you have your y is equals to x squared, you are going to have 2x. That's for manipulation with a simple calculus. If you don't understand what this means, is basically you take the power, you take the power, which is 2, and just basically add it to the integer. And then the power is reduced by that same, by the, uh, by the amount of times you multiply the the power so in this instance it becomes 2x but this this is not a proper example you don't expect uh you don't expect examples or regular phenomena to occur in this format this is just to show you it's just to show you how fast um, Euler's method can deviate from what is actually meant to be accurate so using Euler's method you can basically solve 
for y at different points. And we are given that we are given that x at 1.5 is uh, x at uh, the 1.5 point is equal to this. At the fifth point, rather, is equal to 1.5. So if you should check, if you should cause, if you should calculate with the same method I'm going to use in this example, you'll be able to get the value of y at 0.1 to be 1.2, y point at the value of y at also 0.2 to be equal to 1.42. And these are like all the values you get for y. But the interesting part of this is if you look at this equation gives us the formula for finding the value of y already. So it is pointless in this kind of scenario. It is pointless doing any Euler's method because you already have the, the direct answer for finding the value of y. And so we are basically just going to use that. And if you draw out a table, I'm using this table just for the purpose of illustration. You don't need to draw out this table. So at the first step, the first initial step, what we were given is the value of, um, of y at this point is equal to 1.5 and all of that. At uh, the value of xn is 1.5. So we are asked to find, we just want to find the values of y at all of these different points. So the first one is we are given uh, one, right? If you divide it into five different steps, the value, the initial, the initial value is uh the the h of this of finding the initial values of y will be 0 0.1. That means you're adding 0 0.1 to the values of the preceding uh, value of xn or yn. So if you should put uh, the value of xn here, which is 1.1 into this formula, y is equal to s squared, what you have is 1.21. That's the actual value of what you're supposed to get. But using Euler's method, you get 1.2. You can see that it's pretty much close. That's like 0.01% um, deviation. So it's pretty much accurate. But if you look at the trend going downwards, you start to see much more larger the, um, deviations. Although it's still manageable, but it's just telling you that if you should use a lower step size probably use 0 0.01 and then you have to like have this an end that is equal to 0 to 20. by the time you get to 20 you probably be expecting a deviation of close to one percent so the, what basically that means is that is it basically portrays the point that Euler's method attains just the speculative states the larger the step you take and that's basically what that shows now a proper example of Euler's method um approximate the solution of of y of y prime when y is equal to minus two y plus four. So using so the what basically if you remember from the Lagrange um, notation that I that I explained at the beginning. So basically what this means is the y dx is is just is equivalent to saying the y dx is the differentiation uh, the differentiation of of this equation is equal to minus two y plus four using the Euler's method with initial condition y is equals to um, zero when x is y is equals to one when x is equals to zero and the step size of h is equals to 0 0.1 so basically the same method as the preceding example but you see uh with this example you should get the gist of how Euler methods work so using the Euler method we can actually calculate the approximate values of y at different time steps as we weren't given any upper limits on the time the amount of times points to be used for this uh, example, we, I choose to use five, but ideally three should be fine. Remember, less is more accurate. So the more you, the larger you go, the less accurate it becomes. But I choose to use five so that I like just buttress the points. So we start with an empty table for illustrative purpose. So you have uh, the same table from the preceding example, and you are given the value of X at the point zero, that's at uh, x at the point where n is equal to zero, to be equal to zero, and then y at the point of when n is equal to, at points n equals to zero to be equal to one. So you had the the step size. So the next one is going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and for the fifth one also is going to be 0 0.5. So that's how you get this the value of x a in a lower this way. So don't be confused by that. So from the questions, we are giving the value of initial uh, yn as one. So that's where we have yn. If you look at, if you remember from the question, we are giving the value of y when x is equal to zero to be equal to one. And that's basically what we have here. So the initial step is given us, the initial value of y at point zero is given as one. And so remember the um, Euler's formula that I gave initially to find the value of 
n of y when n is equal to one. You basically use the value of y n when n is equal to zero. And that's what is happening here. So you have one plus 0 0.1 uh, multiplied by the derivative of y n in respect to x n. And luckily for us in this example, we are given the, the equation to find the, the differentiation between of y n in respect to x n. And that's equals to minus two y plus four. Basically this is telling us to ignore the value of x n. That's what this particular equation is telling us. It's not going to always be like this, but basically, well, uh, for instance, in the, in the an, uh, another example is if you are using um, velocity, for instance, the displacement over time, uh, you are going to be using the displacement and you're also going to be using the time. So none of those values is being ignored. Well, in this particular instance, the value of x is being ignored in the equation, but probably is negligible. So you, to find the value of y, you put the previous, the present value of y n, which is one into the equation, that's minus two times one plus four. That's minus two plus four is equals to minus, is equals to two. Multiply that by 0 0.1, we have 0 0.2 and one plus 0 0.2. So the new value of y1 is equal to 1.2. So you can impute that there for purpose of illustration. And so it's when xn is equal to 0 0.1 at point n equals to one, yn is equal to 1.2. So you by, to solve the value of two, to solve the value of y at point n equals to two, we are going to also use the value of y at point n equals to one. We use the preceding step to solve for the future step. So the same thing that I said, to solve y2, you use the preceding one, which is yn, the one we just solved, yn is equal to 1.2, that was just inputted there, multiplied by the step size, that's 0 0.1, and a function of the derivative of yn in respect to xn. So the same thing, you put 1.2 into the derivative function, and that's minus two, multiplied by 1.2 plus four. The uh, aggregation of this, or the calculation of this, gives uh, 1.36. And that's repeated also in the table. So we know the value of N2 of both Xn and then Yn. So we use the same formula to solve for Y3, use the same formula, the same way to solve for Y3. So this time we're using the value of Y2, which is 1.36 from the preceding step. And that's what is used to find the value of Y3. The same way you put it to the, the function, which is minus two Y plus four. And that way you get a y3 that is equals to 1.488. Then also the fourth step, the same thing, you get a function of y4 is equals to 1.5904. And the same way too with the fifth step, you, you impute the value of y4 from the preceding step, which is 1.5904. It's imputed into this new to solve for y5. That's 1.5904 plus 0 0.1 times the derivative of this function y in respect to xn. And that's what is just to get the y5. And at the end of the day, you have a table that looks very similar to this. Uh, so basically what this, what this, the interpretation of this is that we have to find the value of, the value of, uh, of y when x is equals to 0 0.1. We're not given any specific upper limits of what's to find, but we just went ahead to tell you to prove that we can get up to a step five. So uh, if you need the value of, at any point of the graph, what basically does means that if you draw a graph and the value of X for, for whatever parameter that interprets at, you can just basically draw a table of that same value. And then just basically stepwise using Euler's method, find the exact, value of y at that point. And with that, you can find the slope and that slope can be imputed into the general function. And that general function can be used to solve your equation or the problem you need. You need this to solve. But that's basically how Euler's method is calculated. And by applying the Euler's method, we obtain approximate values of y at different time steps, like I just said. And as we increase the number of steps, uh, the approximation becomes closer to the actual solution of differential equation. Uh, please note that the Euler's method can produce less accurate results for certain nodes, especially when the step size h is relatively large. However, it serves as a starting point for understanding numerical methods and forms the foundation of more accurate techniques like the Rungakuta method and Pujita-Kureta methods, uh, which I will still talk on about in this presentation. 
one something else that you should also notice Euler method is going to be difficult to solve some certain types of equations like stiff equations uh, which i'll touch more on the next uh, methods so uh diving into uh Runga-Kutta method uh unlike Euler's method which is just like one formula or just one method for solving um ODEs that's ordinary differential equations Runga-Kutta methods are a family of numerical methods for solving several for solving different types of ODEs and there is a large family con comprising of several different methods and a lot more research has still been done on these methods and a lot has still been being updated to so it's basically like a family of methods and it's a way more accurate method compared to Euler's and it works by approximating the solution of the ODE over a discrete set of points. And it was developed by two German mathematicians, Runga and Kuta. That's, and it's also called the Halki method, which I also use annotation in previous, in consequent examples. So uh, Runga Kuta method is an effective and widely used method for solving the initial value problems of the differential equations. The Runga Kuta method can be used to construct high order accurate numerical methods by functions self without needing the higher derivatives of functions. Uh, it is it is like one of the most okay. I'll, 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 I'm going to show I'm going to show one of the methods that is mostly and largely used to solve differential equations, specifically ordinary differential equations. And like I said, there are several methods in the family. Some of the most popular methods are the forward Euler's method, the midpoint method, on Hoyne's method, Ralston's method, and the Runga-Kutta four method, uh, the, or you call it Alki four method, which is what I'll talk about later. And we also have Dorman Twins method. And we don't need to like, it's, it's uh, the methods are too large for us to cover everything in this particular topic, in this particular presentation. So I'll focus on Runga Kuta four methods and is a photo order accurate numerical method and is the most popular amongst the Runga Kuta classes of methods. And is, in wide, is the most widely used method for solving ordinary differential equations. It's used basically in, in every instances where you find calculus in finding instantaneous value of the differential of an equation. Lugankuta four method is probably used there. It's used in the uh, the designing of the logic boards of uh, speedometers, used in designing the logic board of hospitals, uh, thermometers, and all of those things. That's why you hear things like the thermometers of used in an hospital is way more accurate than the thermometer you use at home, especially the ones that are used in the emergency unit or whatever the name is called. And Runga-Kutta method is also very applicable to stiff equations. Well, stiff equations are basically equations that the values or the parameters change at rates that are usually very high. And it's already difficult to solve that with uh, arithmetic operations. And it becomes even astronomically more difficult to solve when those values change faster than the equation can catch up with. Especially like the, the same example of driving from Abeokuta to Lagos or from driving from Lagos to Ibadan. The, you don't expect the speed of the car to remain constant along the whole journey. When a driver encounters a portal, he probably reduces the speed. He encounters an intersection, he reduces the speed. So the speed, although the speed is given like miles per hour or kilometer per hour, but in terms of seconds, it's, it's actually changing at rates that is so fast that ordinary methods are not going to be able to solve. That's why Rurakuta method is perfect for those kind of um, problems. So um, this example is going to show how the formula for Rurakuta method is derived. It's something you should know about Rurakuta method before we dive in is compared to Euler's method, it is a lot much more difficult to calculate and the value so for that's why I said if you need something that's just going to give you estimates of the value of the differential equation, it's it's most times usually just good enough to just use Euler's method. But if you need the a lot more accurate uh, answer, or you need a lot more accurate solution for your differential equation, that's when you need to do run quota. Just know that it is going to be resource intensive or re resource requesting. So instead of solving for different values of y at different points, 
uh, Nguyakuta solves for different value of the intermediate slope. And you, you understand what I mean by different values of the intermediate slope compared to the way Euler's method solves those equations. So in a given ordinary differential equation, the y dx, the function of x in respect to y with initial conditions, y is equal to y naught, and then x is equal to x naught. To find the value of y is equal to y naught plus k, at x is equal to s naught plus h, we use the following terms. And this is basically um, Vungakuta's formula. So to find the best uh, intermediate, to, to be clear, this is uh, RK4. This is the RK4 method, not generally Vungakuta. So to find the intermediate at K1, this is the formula you use. H is still the same uh, parameter that was used in Euler. That's the step size and the function of x naught at y naught. And basically, to find the intermediate slope at k2 at uh, at two is equal to the same thing. The step size multiplied by the function of x naught over half of the step size plus y naught of the half plus half of the preceding intermediate slope. The same thing applies for the third one, and the fourth one is different because you are not finding you are not getting half of the preceding step from of the, for the uh, value of K4. It, the next example I'm going to show is going to show how, what this interprets as. So the summation of the average is gotten by, you basically find the summation of the average of all of those intermediate slope. And you basically add them into this uh, K0 plus two K2 plus two K3 plus K4. And all of it's divided by one over six. Well, something you should note is that there are different, uh, there are different ways this formula can be written as, as you probably already know from basic arithmetics, this H can be imputed into this, into the bracket. So in, if you search online for different formulas, for the formula of RK4, you probably see situations where you'll find K1 is equals to X naught H as a function to Y H as Y naught H. What I basically mean is that H is imputed into the function and it's not, is not a product of the whole function. So finally, when you get the the uh, the summation of the average of the intermediate slope, you add it to y naught, and that's how you get the y at that end step, not the general y. So basically, the same way, uh, the same answer that was gotten at y naught, y equals to one, for instance, in Euler's methods. So in this place. You are basically finding the value of y. So you, just, you, you can already see that it's a lot difficult to solve this than compared to Euler's method. And I will show you an example where all of this is implemented. And like I said, why not the value? Like I said, in Euler's method also, why not the value of the solution at the current time step? And y1, y is subscript one is the value of the solution at the next step. H is the step size, which is a constant and function x, x is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. All right. Yeah, you can continue. I think it's one individual that I wanted to just log on. So, uh, so the function x n at y n represents the derivatives of y with respect to x. The same uh, parameters that is imputed into Euler's method. And the same parameters are also imputed into Rungakuta. The only difference that you should just take notice, instead of finding the value of y at different points of y, or at different in respect to different points of x. Instead, we are using the values of the intermediate slopes at different points of the slope. That's K1, K2, K3, and then K4. And that's what is like so that was submitted or aggregated to find the value of why not at that particular point. So um using the same example as a previous uh Euler's method, so we're giving the same um problem. So I made the solution of the y dx is equals to remember y prime is the same as the y dx is equals to minus two y. It's just basically in, uh, in case I forgot to say this before. It's basically just uh, letting you know that it's the first order equation. That's why you just have only one y prime. So you have the y dx of minus two y plus four using the Euler's method. Oh, this is wrong. This is a typo. Using the Runge-Kutta method with initial conditions y is equals to one when X is equals to zero and the step size of H is equals to 0 0.1. So like Euler's method also, we are given to Y is equals to minus two Y plus four. And from the formula for Rongakuta, 
you find the first intermediate. That's uh, the intermediate slope. That's h plus f is equal to x naught is equal to the function of the derivative of y naught in respect to x naught. And so it's basic. It's very easy to solve this. Just look at uh, the value of our step size is h and is equal to zero point one. So zero point one, a product of the function of zero and one. And we are given the value, the initial value of x zero, of x naught to be equal to zero, and the initial value of y at point zero to also be equal to one. If, if you input it into this function, into the two, so basically what this means is that if you see any, anywhere you find the function of this, the derivative of this, you have a function, you have an equation for solving that particular problem that arithmetics cannot solve. So that's basically what you're doing here. You use the value of y, into this, and that's equals to two from the, if you remember from the previous step. So multiply that by the step size, that's the value of our initial slope. K1 therefore is equals to 0 0.2. That's 0 0.1 multiplied by two. Then for K, for K2, it's quite different from, if you notice that it's quite different from the way K1's, um, K2 and K3 are similar. K1 and K4 are different. Just note that. Um, so, the step size is multiplied by the function of x naught over all of this, right? So basically, you input all of those same values into this. So 0 0.1, the product of this function. And if you should calculate all of this and you get a function of 0 0.05 in respect to 1.1, remember, you input it into this derivative function. That's minus 2y plus 4. If you should put that into this, you get, and if you put that into that function, the value of y, which is 1.1. .1. So we are basically disregarding the value of x, the same way we described it with Euler's method. So you put it in that function and you submit it, you get a value of 0 0.1, it. That's if the value of k2. k3, the same way you calculate it. It's the same formula as k2. Just the only difference is that k2 is using the preceding value of k1 and k3 is also going to use the preceding value of k2. And basically you find the intermediate slope kt and you basically get an answer here to 0 0.1 each two and k4 is the same way to just that the function is the equation for solving this is actually different so you have you're not finding the average you're not finding you're not dividing the step size by two and also not dividing the preceding step by two also we are using the direct value of the step size and also the preceding value k3. So you get a function of 0 0.1 in respect to 1.1 is 2. As usual, you disregard 0 0.1 and impute 1.1 is 2 into minus 2y plus 4, you get 1.636. So 0 0.1 times 1.636, you get 0 0.1636. So that's the value of our k4. So when you now do all of this, remember, then you find the aggregate of the values of our intermediate slope. So you find k is equals to 1, point, uh, 1 over 6, k naught plus 2k2 plus 2k3, and then plus k4, the last k4 we got. So you had all of those values. Remember all of those values we got. You had everything into this equation, and you get 1.0.86. The summation of all of this results into 1.0.86. 1 over 6 divided by 1.0.86, it's 76 rather. You have 0 0.181. So but what this is saying is, the average slope at point y. It's important to note that unlike Euler's method that estimates the value of slope from point y to ym plus one, this one is instead finding the discrete value of the slopes in, at, each, at each individual point and then finding a summation to get the average value at that particular point. And yeah, so you have the summation of the intermediate slopes. So therefore the slope is equal to zero point, not the slope, the summation of the intermediate slope is equal to 0 0.1812. So if you find, of course, the uh, you then you put it into the general equation, which is y naught plus k. It doesn't have to be y naught. It can also be as well be y1. It can also be as well be y n or y n plus one, whatever we usually impute it as. But in this instance, because we are solving for the value of y1, remember, we are using the preceding value. That's why it is y naught. So it's to solve for the value of y1, we use y naught. So y naught, which we were given from the question, is equals to one. So one plus the intermediate slope we just calculated, that's 0 0.1812. 
and I will not go further to to calculate all of the the rest, uh, the rest uh values of y two, y three, y four, because it's like as you have already seen, it's a lot more difficult to calculate all of this. Probably if I had to do this, this slide would probably be more than hundred pages. So uh, so basically, this is that you solve for the value of y one, and if you now want to solve for the value of y two, y three, or for however amount of steps you want to take, just like Euler's method, you then take the value of y two. That's what is repeated into this uh, general function, which is so. If it is, for instance, you are solving for the value of y two, it is equals to y two. Y two y subscript two is equals to y not no y one y subscript one plus k. So what basically what that means is that in finding your in you know, all the formulas you use for finding your uh finding your k, you know the formulas used for finding your k, you are going to be using the value of y1 which you just solved so in where you in all the instances where you have y not being used here you're going to be imputing you're going to be replacing it with y1 which is the 1 point, 0 point something you just got or 1.162 that you got for the value of y not that's basically how you just solve it so it's a it's a huge repetitive steps just like Euler's method just need to just repeat and maintain the same level of accuracy and you basically solve for each value of y depending on the amount of steps you choose to solve for. And that's basically how to solve for the value of y2 to ym plus one as, as, as whatever amount of steps you choose to decide or you decide on. So um, by applying the fourth order Lungakuta method, we obtain a more accurate approximate values of y at different time steps compared to the Euler's method. Um, the RKF method takes into account the slopes at multiple intermediate points. That's what I just explained before. So instead of like the Euler's method just finding the average of slopes or as or assuming the slopes at different points is still the same, although it has cost correction, but assuming the slopes at different points is still the same, it just basically just find an approximate value of what the value of Y can be at those points. But instead, from Gakuta method, use the value of slopes at multiple intermediate points within each step. And that's result in the value of a more precise numerical approximation of the solution of whatever equation that you want to solve. Notes, still on ordinary differential equations. It doesn't solve, it's not applicable directly to partial differential equations. And remember, differential equation, uh, ordinary differential equations are differential equations that is just have the function of, a simple function of itself or just, if, or just only one dependency. Or like partial equations that can have multiple dependencies and multiple orders of dependencies. So um, as the step size h decreases, the RQ4 approximation becomes even closer to the actual solution to the of the differential equation. As you can already tell, if we should reduce the amount of steps that you need to take, the same way with um, Euler's method, you get like like what I, I said previously. If you choose to use y3 from you remember from that table of Euler's method y3 is more accurate compared to the actual size compared to y5. So that's basically what it's just telling you that if you use less value of h, you are bound to have a more accurate answer. Although, although, uh, although uh, Rungakuta method provides the answer in, it provides the answer that it gives as an error correction of the other raised to the power four. That's why it's called RK4. Basically, that what, what that means is that if you have a step size of 20 and you choose to reduce it by 10, you are increasing the you are increasing the accuracy or the the uh, deviation by uh, deviation for, for error by 10 raised to the power four. That's basically what it just means. And if you increase it by four, you are increasing the the deviation for error by 10 raised to the power four the same way. That's if you have a step size of 20. So um, the next uh, method is the predictor corrector method. And the predictor corrector method is, is not a met, is not a particular equation like the RK4 or the Euler's method. It's just like a concept or as it is described, um, a method. So is a method or is, so a, a, the better term to describe it is a numerical technique. And it's used to approximate, approximate the solutions of ordinary differential equations, just like Euler's and Runga. And it combines both a predictor step, as you probably already know from the name, uh, a predictor step and also a corrector step to improve the accuracy of the approximation. 
the predictor, the whole purpose of a predictor collector method is to strike a balance between computational efficiency and also improved accuracy. Like I said before, it is astronomically difficult to calculate the value of RK4, especially for resources when you have limited resources. And you you, you know that Euler's method is not to give you accurate thing. It's not going to give you an accurate solution. And Euler and Runga is resource intensive. So the, the points in the middle that gives a little bit of both, but with increased efficiency, with computational efficiency and also accuracy is uh, the predictor corrected method. And the way it works is it basically, it basically use a predictor step can use and it can use it can use several methods. That's why I say it is not a formula like uh, both of them. So it's just like a technique. So it can use the predictor step, and some of the predictor step you can use is you can use Euler's method. You can also use RK4 as a predictor step, and then use probably uh, there are different variants of Vungakuta. You can also use R6 or some other methods to find a more accurate corrector. That's the value or the average of both values is going to give a better approximation. Or the solution to the OD compared to using one either method alone, and it's also faster to calculate. So, not uh, by by faster to calculate. I don't mean by calculation by hand. I mean by the amount of resource that is used to calculate. So, uh, in the predictor step, an initial estimation of the next value of the function is made using a simple method like Euler's method or any other explicit numerical method. Um, Euler's method takes a small step alongside along the direction of the slope at the current point to predict the next value. That's basically what I have explained. So it just basically approximates the the value of the slope and just takes the next. It finds the value of y along those di along the same direction of the slope with assumption, right? So in the corrector step, the initial prediction from the predictor step as from the value of y n that you get from the Euler step is used for that's the prediction. And that's what is used and it is refined and corrected to provide a more accurate approximation for the whatever method you use as the corrector step. In simple term, what it means is that, like a good example is the examples that I gave in both uh, methods. If you should find the value of y, of yn or yn plus one, however we, using Euler's method, you just take that and put it somewhere probably you get 1.5 as your value of yn plus one. And with Euler's method, with our KFA method, you solve it and also use it as the corrector step. And so you basically just find the average of both of them. So it is faster for you to, it's faster for you to solve it when you know the target of where you are going to. So you know that, okay, this, what I expect to get is uh, around 1.5. So if it is more than 1.5, you know that you need cost correction, or you need to basically, you need to basically uh, recalculate or do cost correction of your parts of your slope or something else, or whatever solution that is applicable for that particular problem. So um, by using a more accurate method in the corrector step, the errors that accumulate in the predictor, in the predictor step can be reduced, that's like Euler's. And before I dive into this example, uh, a good place where something like this is used is uh, in navigation. In uh, there was there's a story of a old Russian, uh, uh, what's it called? A old, a old story of a Russian sailor driving is uh, navigating or trying to like explore the open sea, and calculus was still pretty much very new at the, at that particular point. So he basically just calculated. The distance from, or he estimated the distance, and he did not take into cognizance some of those um, values or some of those parameters that change constantly, like the speed of the wind, the speed of his um, vessel, and all of those things. They basically just started the journey, and at the amount of days where he was expected to spend on sea, he discovered that he landed at a different particular point, at a different point. So that led to. Uh, new innovations or new ways of thinking about how to calculate uh, navigation on, on sea. So um, a good example that is used in those kind of instances uh, is the predictor corrector method, because you know that using uh, Rungakuta is difficult to use and it's resource, inst uh, resource intensive. So you basically use Euler's method to get a predictive status or a predictive value. And then you use your, uh, basically, if you need to find, basically what it just means is that if you need to find the direction of where you are going to either 
uh, you need to go two degrees north or two degrees uh, south or whatever. You use Euler's method to predict fast enough when you get two degrees. And in the background, Rungakuta method goes over that same value and gives the exact correct value. That's if you use Rungakuta method for the correct step. So it gives the correct value of what that's supposed to be. So it basically it was correct. And that's what's, uh, so the, the vessel or whatever is using that navigation system can cause correct and follow what is more accurate. So basically that's like a real life use of a uh, predictor corrected method. So um, just like the examples we saw before, minus two y plus four using the predictor corrector step. And similarly, like I said, you use a predictor step. In this instance, we use Euler's method as a predictor step. So you solve for the value of y, of y1. I don't need to like show the calculation of y1 because we already did that with Euler's method. So uh, you get a value of y1 is equals to 1.21 using the same way. Euler's method is pretty straightforward to calculate. So you get the value is equals to 1.21. And with that, you apply it to RK4. It is bonding it to, I bonded everything into one page. So it looks a little bit uh, disorganized, but you get the point that we're just trying to solve for the value of Y1. And like I said before, it is more intensive to solve because you have to find the values of intermediate slope at different points. So at the end of the day, you find a value of y1 is equals to 1.1987. It is quite similar to 1.21, right? That's like 0.02% difference. It's quite similar, but in some certain instances where you need a lot higher precision, a lot higher uh, precision, like um, equipment used in, in the hospitals for surgery and other kind of things, this could mean a matter of life or death for whatever application that um, equipment is used for. 1.1987 looks small on face value, but it could be an aggregation of this could lead to fatal uh, fatal consequences. So it basically corrects it to 1.1987 and then finds the, uh, uh, and this is basically the same thing I said, it applies the corrected method and you basically find the average of both of them. And that's what you use as your that's what you use to as your value of y at each individual different point. So uh, the facial equations, like I've explained, enable us to describe and predict how quantities changes over time with respect to other variables, allowing us to model natural phenomena, analyze complex systems. For instance, if you ask, if you are asked to calculate the volume of a of a river, for instance. You can calculate the volume of water in a cup because you can measure the size of the cup. You can calculate the volume of water in a tank you can, because you can measure the size of the tank. But if you have to measure something like the volume of water in a river, it's almost impossible to calculate that with regular arithmetics. But with uh, calculus and then differential equations, you can find an estimate of the closest value of what the volume is supposed to be. And that's, those are the some of the problems that differential equations, that's like a trivial example, but it's basically just a simpler example to show the kind of problems differential equations can solve. And Euler method, Rungakuta method, and a combination of both in prediction correction method um, provide us with the methodology and framework to solve most of these problems. And my colleague is going to be discussing uh, multi step formula methods, two points, boundary value, and also stability and convergence. So I'll stop sharing for him to uh, start sharing his own portion. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Um, do we have any questions so far? Questions? All right. So can we have the next presenter, please? Good afternoon, everyone. One minute, please. Thank you. Can we all hear me? Yes, yes. All right. Well done. So uh, the first topic I'll be taking is a multiple step equation. And multiple step equation is I, I think is the elementary of, of mathematics really. It's um it's the case where where we find ourselves in where we are saying something like three x is equals to nine. 
um, then you have to divide what how to get x, you know, um, for y is equals to 16, you know, and what, what really happens in, in multiple step equation is you are going to be taking it step by step until you are you get to uh, a point whereby the constant uh, is on one side and the variables is also on one side so that you can um, divide to the simplest um, point and get your um, equation. I, I know if we remember when we're doing um, mathematics in primary school, secondary school, where you, you find, um, you ask questions like, um, a boy a boy sold um, maybe eggs or something, and then you are asked to find how many, how many eggs he sold or all those kind of things, where you have to then start solving step by step to you, you, you are separating the variables, you separate the variables from the constant so that you can get to the last point whereby you know what that variable, what one unit of that variable is equals to. So um, the, to make it easier, let me just explain one or two things before I, I give examples. So um, if we remember also the, the case of um, board mass, now, as we, we grow, grow higher, the, it's called order of operation. So that what, what you do is you try to understand which signs, which signs are more important than the other so that you can, so that you can solve them and make it your equation simpler. And then we have cases whereby when an, uh, a sign pass, uh, crosses over the equals to, it changes. So for instance, the addition sign, if you take it over uh, the equals to sign is going to change to subtraction, the multiplication sign, we take it over the um, equals to sign is going to change to division. So um, so basically the, the whole concept is to take um, the equations step by step, um, breaking it down, trying to put the variables in one side, most likely the left side of the equation, then making the constants be on the other side, um, the right side of the equation, that's where the equals to is going to be in the middle, and then breaking it down step by step. So you get to a point whereby it's just one or two steps. That's when we call it this two-step equation, um, where you now have the case where you are saying 5x is equals to 25. Then if you divide both sides by five, you then know that one unit of that X is equals to five. Um, so let me just go to um, the examples. Well, okay, before I go there, let me just some vocabularies that we usually use. So when when we're, we're doing multi-step uh, equations, we'll be um, trying to solve equations that inside the bracket first. So that is the first one that we'll call the distributive properties. So when you, as I said earlier, the order of operations, you try, they help you to understand how to take the equation step by step so that um, you are able to get to the simplest form. So when you, you get to a case where in the equations, you, you see um, a bracket sign, a, um, bracket sign, you, you want to first focus on that type of um, the. You want to focus on on what is in the bracket, then solving it so it makes it easier and simpler for you to keep on with your steps. So then we now talk about combining the terms. As I said earlier, the the variables you want them to be in, in together. You want them to be in one side. So what, what we do, you begin things like we're combining terms. So when they, we have a case whereby we have um, 5x plus 6x um, plus 10 is equals to 15, for instance, you want the, the ones that look alike to be on one side 
and you want the ones, um, the ones with the variables to be on one side, the ones with the const that are just constant to be on one side. So at all, all what you are trying to do is to get to a point whereby the equation is very, very simple. So that means it's a step-by-step um, solution to what we are doing. Then we, we talk also about collect light times. I, I mentioned that as I was saying earlier. So I'm going to, I have um, six examples here, just so that um, we can understand it as much as possible. So the first one is 7x minus 9 is equals to 5. Can we see my cursor? So um, um, yes. the 7x minus 9 is equals to 5. So the first thing we want to do in this kind of case, since we don't have any um, brackets, uh, we would want to look at the, the terms in the, in this our equation and see which ones look alike. So if you notice that um, 7x is different from minus nine and is also different from plus five. So what we want to do in this case is to move the minus nine to over the equals to sign. And as I said earlier, that um, when, when we have cases where the equals to sign is supposed to cross over to um, over the uh, sorry the plus sign is supposed to cross over the equals to sign um, equals to sign it's going to change the um, the sign and vice versa so if subtraction is crossing over the equals to sign also it's going to be changing so in this case we yeah are, can we move forward these are yeah. two elementary to be taught at this level please all right all right I'm very fast then. So in that kind of case, so we're saying minus nine plus nine is equals to zero. Then we move, since our sign will change to plus, so that would be five plus nine, that's 14. So we have gotten to the step whereby we're in a two-step, um, two-step. So we have seven X is equals to 14. If we divide both sides by seven, then we know that our one unit of X is equals to two. And the same thing, our second um, example is three, Bracket open y plus two bracket close plus y is equals to fourteen. So in this case now we we're having um, a bracket, in um, and we have. So what we want to do now is we want to try and open this bracket, and to open this bracket we we use the three beside it to open the bracket. If we use the three to open the bracket, we're having three y plus six plus y is equals to fourteen. Then we cannot combine our terms. That's the, the terms that look alike. And since um, 3y and y look um, alike, we try to move them together. So we have 3y plus y, then we would have our 6y, our 6, sorry, moving to over to um, the equals to sign. And if it moves over to the equals to sign, it's going to be changing to, um, the sign is going to be changing to minus. So we'll get to the case whereby we're having 4y is equals to 8. So we divide um four y by four and divide it by four to get the the one unit of y which is going to be two and the same thing the third example is three x plus three is equals to two x plus 13. in this case now if you notice that we have um a variable on the left side and a variable on the right side and constant on both sides also so we want to try and find a way to com, um, combine the terms together. That means moving them, moving the, the, the variables to the left side and the constant to the right side. Although um, in most cases, it's always preferable that the, the uh, variables are on the left side and the constant are on the right. But we might find cases whereby it's vice versa, whichever way um, it still works. So um, 7x, the first thing, we try to do here is move um, our three to the other side. So what we did here is we must, uh, minus uh, three from plus three. So that's then from both sides, then we minus uh, three from, we minus three from 13 also. So we have the case where we have seven X plus two X is equals to 10. Then now we can move our, 2x to the other side. And we're moving our 2x to the other side since this is um, 7x is equals to plus 2x plus 10. That means our 
two our plus two x will be changing to minus when it uh, crosses over the equals to sign. So we have a seven x minus two x is equals to ten. So um, when we divide, we have five um, x is equals to two. Let me rush it because um, this is actually a metric as was said. So the fourth one is um, the fourth example is three brackets open x plus one bracket close is equals to five plus x. So we also have in this case variables on both sides. But if you remember that we have uh, parentheses here, so we want to first try and remove this bracket. So removing this bracket will mean that we are multiplying three. We are multiplying what is in the bracket by three. So that will be having three x plus three is equals to five plus x. In that case, when we, we have it this way, it becomes easier now we can then combine our terms. To combine our terms, that means we want our three to move to the right side and we want our x to move to the left side. And if we're doing that, that means um, the plus three is going to be, we're going to be subtracting it when it goes to the other side. So we're having five minus three is equals to two, as you can see. And this, so if you notice what, what we're just trying to do is just a step-by-step um, breakdown of of our equation until we can get to the last to the last point whereby our variables are on at their um at one unit right at one unit so uh, if we do this we'll be getting two x is equals to two so then we can divide both sides by two then that means x is equals to one then the next um example is two x two bracket open x yeah plus please go to something more important all right. than all this all please. right so that would be all for multi multi steps um equation so the next um topic is two boundary two point boundary values and two point va uh, boundary values what we are um what we are, we are talking about is um we'll be having to differentiate um at two points, at will be given will be we are given two initial conditions whereby our our derivative we want to know from the the first point to the second point we want to see um, the 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 value. So I, uh, that's that's the easiest way to to explain it. Whereby we have two uh, points in in a graph. In the graph, right? And we are differentiating, we are differentiating step by step. So we so what, what we are interested in is knowing the the two points that were given to us in solving the, the, the values of the two points that were given to us. So the first thing we want to do in in two points in two point boundary values is is to first um understand is to first, the, the uh, differentiation equation that was given to us is to first try and break it down into um, a, a diff, like change it from, from the, the values that it was to, I, I like, I in this equation, I used um, P, P value, uh, P variables, just so that um, you might find in other textbooks, uh, they'll use an R, of uh, uh, variable. So the first example here is um, we have two. So this is a two uh, second order differentiation. So we have our y differentiation plus um, we have our y prime prime plus y is equals to zero, and we are given two. Um, we are given two constraints. So the first one is y bracket when um, y is zero is equals to zero and then y when x is um, pi over six is equals to four. So in uh, in the the one in the bracket is the value of x is the value of x. So that means when when y when uh, when we differentiate x when we differentiate x is going to be giving us zero and the same thing for um, when we differentiate 
um, x um, pi over six four. So let's let let me, the first example. The first thing we want to do is we want to solve the uh, differentiation e equation that was given to us. So um, the technique. The technique um, that I use that is easy is to just the prime. So in, in this case, we have two prime. That means we will be changing these two um, exponents. The exponent will be two, right? So that means this y was differentiated twice. So that means our exponent will be two. If we have just one prime, that means it was differentiated once. That means we'll be having, um, in this case, p raised to power one. If it was differentiated three times, we'll be having p raised to power three. Since this is a, a second order uh, differentiation, that means we'll be having two prime prime plus y is equal to zero uh, with our constraints when um, x is zero and when x is pi over six. And we're given the, um, what the differentiation is going to be. So the first thing now is the prime. Um, so this one is two, so that means our p is going to be p squared. And since this is um, zero, this is um, y raised to power zero, since we have nothing, that means it's going to be um, p raised to power zero, which is equal to one. So that means we have p squared plus one is equal to zero. So if we move our one to the other side, we'll be having p squared is equals to plus or minus, or p, yes, plus or minus, um, be equals to minus one, sorry, because to minus one, then p will be equals to the square root. Now, if we're looking for the square root, that means the square root can either be plus or minus. And in, in this case, um, imaginary numbers, the square root of minus one, is i the square root of minus one is i then um for two two boundary values um equations we have a general solution we have a general solution to um the equation it is called um it is y into or y into bracket x is equals to e to power alpha times x c one times cos beta x plus c2 sine beta x. So um, in this case, in, in this case, we um, what we have here, since our p is equal to just plus or minus i, that means we don't have um, an alpha. So in, in, in cases, in other cases, we would we most likely have um, a number here just before the plus or minus i, and that number would be our alpha. And then the, um, the coefficient of i would be our beta. This is just an easy example. So that's why uh, it's this way. So in this case, that means we're having our alpha to be zero and we're having our beta to be zero. So which means we can just ignore and just have our equation to be C times cos S plus C sine cos S. So if we, okay, sorry about that. If we then um, impute our X, our X in this first case, the first constraint was zero. So if we put our X, that will be having C cos zero plus C sine zero in and the cos cos zero is one and sine zero is um zero. So that means we'll be having C C one times one plus C two times zero, which is so this is going to become zero. So that means our answer for this um for when X is zero is going to be just C one. Then when our When, when y, when y is, I mean, I think there's an error. 
when so this should be this should be um pi over six pi over six this one i'll change that later that's a mistake so when x is um pi over six which is equals to four that means c cos pi over six plus c times sine pi over six so we'll be having uh cos pi over six is equals to square root of three over two. Then the sine of pi over six is one, one over two. So if we multiply, we'll be having, um, we'll be having, come on, please. So if we multiply our C, so in this case now, since we already know our C1, our C1 to be zero from the first equation we did. If you remember that we, when we um, solve this equation, C2 is zero. So we have nothing here. Then C1 times one is equals to uh, C1. So that means C1 is equals to zero. So we are, for our first equation, we are able to already find what C1 is. So that means we can impute C1 into the second equation. That means we'll make this C1 zero. So we'll be having the case where we're saying zero times square root over three, um, square root um, three over two times C2 times one over two. So if we do the multiplication, we'll be having zero times um, square root of three over two is equal to zero. So we have one over two C2. So if we then um, divide both sides by one over two, we will have our C2 to be, to be eight. So for this um, equation, we only have um, one, one solution and that is that our X, our Y, into x is equal to x uh, equal to eight sine x. That is our solution. That is when we go back to when we take it back to the formula. When we take it back to the formula. So since all Sorry about that. Since all this is two to be eight, so that is whatever x we put here, we can easily um, find our uh, derivative. Um, another example. So this is the same, the same uh, differential equation. I just changed the uh, the initial conditions. So in this case, uh, we have where um, x is zero and where x is pi. So if we, that means since it's the same equation, this, this part is, is going to stand, whereby we'll be having our alpha to be zero and our beta to be, um, to be zero also. And if we, so if I'll just jump down to where we have our general equation. So for our general equation, when X is zero, we have C times cos zero plus C times sine zero. So the cos zero is one and sine zero is zero. So if we do our um, multiplication, we have C one times one, which is C one and C two times zero is zero. So that means when X is zero, um, zero is equals to C one. So that means we can put, we can take our, for the next equation, we can impute this into our next equation. So we we'll have in this case now x is equals to um, pi. So we have cos cos pi is minus one and sine pi is zero. So when we do our um, when when we quit, we have our answer to be minus c one. So in in this case, we were not able to get an answer for our C2. And since this is a two boundary equation, we are, we are supposed to have um, an idea for both the, the first um, 
con constraint and the second constraint. And we only, we only are able to find this equation can only find for just one single uh, constraint, which is C1. So that means we do not have an equation in this um, for in, in this for this example. So it's possible that in two in two band um, values equation, it's possible that there, there are no um, solutions. So in this kind of case, we have no solution. So another example. So this this is a different example now. In this case, we have um, two prime prime plus four y is equal to zero. This is still a second order differentiation, and our constraint here is when x um, is zero, we have five, and when x is pi over four, we have three. So we we'll first need to solve for our um, equation. So I, in this case, I use um, R just so that we know that we can. It's not there is no uh, real, any alphabet can be used. You can use any alphabet that you're comfortable with. So I'm using R in this case, and we have two prime here. Yeah? So this means our exponent will be two. So we have two raised to power R raised to power two plus four. This is um, zero. Since we have we, um, this y has no prime, that means it's zero. So um, r is power zero is one, and four times one is four. So we have r squared plus four is equals to zero. Now we move our four to the other side. When we move our four to the other side, we have the case where we're saying um, r squared is equals to minus four. So if we want to move our square, we have to square root, um, find the square root of minus four. So the square root of minus four would, so in this case, we know that um, it's impossible. So what we do, um, our imaginary number, so we move um, minus one out. Since four times minus one is the same thing as minus four. So well, this is, we, we, this is fine. So then we can find the square root of four now. The square root of four is two. So and then the square root of minus one is our imaginary i. So we have the case where we're having um, plus minus two i. So in this case, still we don't have an alpha, but we have a beta. So you, when um, from our general equation, we, we can impute our, our beta to be two. But since we have our alpha to be zero, that means automatically you can cancel this out since our alpha is zero. So anything multiplied by zero is going to be zero. So this, we can uh, cancel this out. So just make it easier for us. And we say our equation is now C times cos two X plus C two times sine two X. So our first constraint, our first constraint is when X is five. When x is five, so uh, we're having an. So when x is zero, it goes to five. Apologies about that. So we're having um, our x to be zero. So we impute our x to be zero. So two times zero is also zero. So this will be zero. So we have six um, ci times cos zero plus six. Um, C2 sine zero and cos zero is one, sine zero is zero. So um, our, so this part of our equation is going to be zero. So we have C1 times one, which is equals to C1. So that means our C1 in this case is equals to five. Then our second constraint is, um, we're giving that X is equals to pi over four is equals to three. So um, so that would be us imputing pi over uh, pi over two over four into our uh, our equation. So two times I should have put that down so it's easier for us to we don't get confused. But this is supposed to be two times pi over four. So if we multiply that, we can 
cancel um two can cancel um two years so we have two uh men so we have pi over two as our as our x so this is this equation here is actually beta times x so that's why we have pi over two so we have um because cos pi over two is equals to zero and sine pi over two is equals to one so we we have five Remember that our C1, we've already got our C1 to be five. So we can just impute five here. We have five times zero, which is zero. Then C2 times one, which is equals to C2. So our C2 is equals to three. So that means our equation is um, five cos two X. Remember our X is, uh, our two is our beta plus three sine two X. Um, okay. So our next topic is stability and uh, convergence. Uh, so uh, just, I, I gave uh, definitions, but to really understand stability and convergence is um, stability for instance, is, is a topic under convergence. So to really understand it, we mean I, I would, instead of just reading our definitions for us, I'll try to explain uh, how they all relate. So but, but what, what stability really means is a condition in which we have just um, a slight disturbance in the system that does not stop the, uh, disrupt the system that much. Um, so when, when we're talking about stability convergence, well, we, we are um, numerical schemes, um, numerical series, Right, and you want to know if before when you see a series, you cannot know if that series is is a converge is going to converge or is going to diverge, right? And uh, the only way to really one of the ways to know what is going to happen is um, stability. It's going to give you an idea of what is going to happen in that series that um, you are working on. So. Um, Okay, so a series also, let me, let me just try and explain everything together. And then as I'm explaining it, we'll be able to understand what um, convergence and stability is about. So when, when we, we want to analyze our, our series, as I said earlier, we cannot really know from the start that this, is, um, this, this series is going, to be, um, is going to be converging or is going to be Diverging. But the only re thing we can know is our, uh, you add this. That's really the only idea of all, because that's what we'll be able to see at that point when we're analyzing. So, but how, how then can we go from this state to where, uh, to our you um, analytic that we can know that okay this series that we're working on is converging or is diverging right and so what what we would want to to know is our our um we want to see if our data x our data t are tending to zero we want that to tend to zero in this case we're talking about convergence so that means what we're saying that we, that series should be heading towards zero um, it should be heading towards um, zero. Now, if if as we are working on this, on the uh, analyzing this uh, the series, it is our data x and our data t are tending towards. Sorry, you want someone that wants to ask a question? Hello. Okay. So if if our data x, that means as we are differentiating, right? As we are differentiating the, the series, if it's, we want to know if it's tending towards zero, that would be giving us an idea that, okay, that, that means that this um, equation, this series, sorry, it's going to, it's going to be converging. We, so, but, so all we can really know in this sense is, consistency that as we are differentiating as there, there's a change in our series that the the the, the terms that are reducing towards zero 
So what we can really know in 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 our series, in our convergence series, is is this is our x is our data s and data t are they moving towards zero? And if they are moving towards zero, then we can say okay, we have consistency first. So the first thing we want to even know before and when we are developing our our numerical schemes is is our data x and our data t is it, is it moving towards is it moving towards zero? So if it's moving towards zero, then we can say as we are working on it that okay, this this uh, series is likely to converge because we're having consistency as we are as we are going. So, um, in inconsistency, right? In the the our tau, our tau will be giving us an idea that this this um this series is moving towards zero. So we can then have an idea that okay, that this is this equation is likely to be a convergence. Then that's what we can then talk about stability. Now, um, stability is like no, the, the normal of, of our, say of our series, say A, say is A for instance, is less than one. So as we are working on it, you know, as a, the definition I gave earlier, there might be one or two disturb, but our stability on that series, we must, we must be able to know that the, at every point, it is less than one. It is less than one. Then if if we have that case whereby our, um, our A, let, let me use A, our A is epitomizing to um a solution error that continues the series that makes the series continue lesser than one then we can say okay this this series is it has consistency and is stable and is tending to zero then that's when we cannot say oh okay then we are having um this um series is going to converge so that is the best way for me to explain um, stability and convergence. So convergence is the series itself, but we cannot know from the points where we want to analyze. So what we can really know is our consistency. Why we are working on it is our our data um, x and our data t are they tending towards zero? When if we can see that it's tending towards zero, then we're, we're having an idea that this series is likely to converge. Then we want to then know if our stability, if it's, if the normal of our stability does, if it's adding, if it is less than one, if it is less than one and the, the solution error, the solution error is still uh, within that one as the series continues. So if, if it continues that way, then, we can then analyze that, oh, this series that we're working on, this numerical scheme that we're working on is going to converge. Um, that, that I believe is the best way to explain stability so that we can, we can understand um, it and I don't have to start. So stability is under, under convergence. So when we, when we have um, consistency and we have stability, that's, and our consistency is tending towards zero. Then we can say this um, this numerical scheme I'm working on is going to converge. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I think uh, this is just two of you to present. Yes, yeah, just the two of us. But I learned four of you were available as at last time I asked. That was over two weeks. I think I think we they just lasted about two weeks or so. Yeah, that was two weeks ago. Last said that was four. We have two. We've been two for a long time, sir. Oh, really? Yes, okay. Um, do we have any questions for the presenters? Yeah, well, a general comment before uh, you bring up your questions. Um, stop. Yeah, just a bit.
Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, you can. Right. Okay, so well, I think um, generally the first presenter had almost forty something forty something slides to present, whereas the other fellow just presented a few of it, and I felt the presentation was sloppy at first. But well, for me, the workload wasn't evenly shared, right? So someone was presenting uh, very little effort 